Welcome back, everyone. I'm so excited that you have joined us for our third installment of our Easter story. I'm super excited that you guys have kept with us and kept with me during this time. Oh, guys, I miss you so, so much. It, it is hurting me. I am an extrovert, which means I love to be around people, and I am not around enough people. I love you guys. I miss you guys. I am praying for you guys. I hope you know that. Uh, I want to give you guys just one announcement. I only have one announcement today, and that is we have postponed Easter services. Uh, what that means is that uh, Easter is determined on a different day every single year. It's always on a Sunday, so it's never the same day every single year. The church gets to determine that. So this year, because of the pandemic getting in the way, we have decided what better way to celebrate Easter, the day that Jesus comes out of the grave, than us coming out of this pandemic. Now, the day for that is to be determined because we don't know what's going to happen, and we don't know uh, if we're going to be, uh, if it'll be a month, it'll, if it will be two months, we don't know. But we will postpone those things until... Uh, and to give you the date as soon as we know possible. And for those of you that are hungry for an Easter egg hunt, I promise you, we're going to have a big, huge Easter egg hunt, okay? Have my word, that's the plan, okay? So, we won't be delivering eggs, we'll just have a giant Easter egg hunt once we have our big, huge Easter celebration. Got it? Good. All right, let's jump into our story, okay? We're going to be in our Bibles today. You're going to want to have a Bible for this. So, if you don't have one, pause the video, go get one real fast, okay? So we have been in our Easter story talking about the four words that tell us our story. There is arrival, supper, betrayal, and resurrection. To catch you up, here is everything you're going to need to know to know about today's sermon. Uh, we talked about arrival. This story talks about how Jesus came into town riding on a donkey into Jerusalem. This is the very first step in our story. Because before Jesus gets on the donkey, he knows everything he's going to have to go through on the cross. Oh, no. But that doesn't stop him. Jesus loves us even though he was going to go through a lot of pain. So he hops on the donkey and rides into Jerusalem. <laughs> then... Part two of this, we talked about supper, and we talked about Jesus' last supper that he was going to have before crucifixion. So, at this supper, he was surrounded by all his best friends, and he knew that all his best friends were going to betray him. He knew that they would leave him in his most desperate hour of need. But even though bad stuff was going to happen, Jesus still loved them even though. And so, he served them food. He washed their feet, and he even took time to talk with him before they were going to desert him. Okay, so now that you're all caught up, and now that you know those past two words, let me introduce you to our third word in our story, part three, which is betrayal. Now, this word is sometimes a scary word, and I want to let you know that uh, my little disclaimer into our story today is that we will be talking about things uh, that led up to Jesus' death. I'll be sparing the gory details, but I will be talking about things that might make you cringe. Okay, so that's my disclaimer. Point it right here. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, disclaimer. Okay, we're going to be talking about some uncomfortable stuff, so I hope that you know and you're prepared for it. Pain is a huge part of this story. It is important for us to know the pain that Jesus went through because it is in that pain that he chose to go through us that shows us the greatest love ever. The Bible talks about how the greatest love you can give is to lay your life down for your friends. And that's what Jesus did. That's exactly what he did. He gave up his life so that we could have a friendship with him and with God. It's the greatest story of love. It is the greatest story ever ever told. If you have your Bibles, in which I hope you got time to go get your Bibles, if not, go grab it right now, okay? We're going to be in our Bibles, and I want you to follow along, and we'll be reading from the book of Mark. This is the third book in the New Testament. Matthew, no, second, second, whoops, Pastor Jesus lost it. Matthew, Mark, okay? We're going to be in that book. We're going to start in chapter 14, all right? And we will be reading a lot of this story and I'll be jumping it around in and out to explain kind of what's happening and why it's happening. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 14, and this is where our story starts. After eating at the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples, without Judas, because Judas has already left to betray Jesus, are on their way 
uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark 14, verse 32 through 43. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him and became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went out a little further and fell to the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and he found the disciples had fallen asleep. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them asleep again, for they couldn't keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But no, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas... One of the twelve disciples, one of his best friends, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. Now, what's happened here is that Judas has just sold Jesus to the men that want to kill him. He sold him for 30 pieces of silver. And they're standing at this point and Jesus is staring them down and they're staring them back. But Jesus doesn't fight them. Jesus instead goes with them. And here's what happens if you look at verses 48 through 50 real fast. Jesus asked them, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with me with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there among you each and every day. But these things are happening to fulfill what scriptures say about me. Those are the prophecies that we mentioned before. Then all his disciples deserted him and ran away. What we just read in those two verses that all the disciples desert and leave Jesus as he's being arrested, as he's being taken away by his enemies. And notice how Jesus doesn't fight them. Jesus, all powerful. He can do anything. And yet he decides to let this happen because it's because of God's will and not his own. As the soldiers take Jesus to the Pharisees, uh, who, and the Pharisees were kind of like the Jewish pastors of the time who had been corrupted. Peter was following from a distance and he wanted to continue to be with Jesus while the other disciples ran away. Peter was Jesus' best friend, was considered probably one of the best disciples, but he was Jesus' best friend. So he follows at a distance. Now, if you'll turn in your Bibles to chapter 14, verses 53 through 55, and then we're going to jump to 66 through 72. They took Jesus to the high priest, home where the leading priests and the elders and the teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right to the high priest's courtyard, where he sat with the guards, warming himself by the fire. While Peter was sitting in the courtyard, one of the servant girls who worked for the high priest came by and noticed Peter warming himself at the fire. She looked at him closely and said, You are the one, the one that follows with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it. I do not know what you're talking about, he said, and he went on to the entryway. Just then a rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began telling the others, This man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little later, some of the other bystanders confronted Peter, saying, You must be one of them, because you are a Galilean. Peter swore, A curse on me! If I am lying, I do not know this man you are talking about. And immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. Suddenly, Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the roosters crow twice, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he broke down and wept. <laughs> Remember in how in our last discussion, 
how Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him. He even told Peter, hey, you're going to deny me three times. Peter did not believe that he would ever do this. But once he was standing there and the people started to call him out, he got scared for his life. He thought they were going to kill him. And Peter did exactly what Jesus said, saying that he never knew Jesus. He even swore that he didn't even know Jesus. And immediately those words came into his mind and he regretted it. He cried and he ran away. Even in Jesus' most desperate hour, his best friend runs away. The Pharisees then took Jesus to Pilate. Now, Pilate was kind of uh, the president of the area, okay? He was in charge of Jerusalem, and if anything had the final say, it was Pilate in Jerusalem. So the Pharisees wanted to bring Jesus to Pilate so that Pilate could issue the death penalty because they didn't want to be the ones to blame for Jesus' death. So... Uh, This is where we're going to read next in Matthew 15, verses 6 through 15, about Jesus standing before Pilate. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus and led him away. That means they tied him up and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, Are you going to answer them? What about all these charges they are bringing up against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during Passover celebration to release one prisoner, any one the people requested. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to be released as a prisoner as usual. And he said, Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? Pilate asked. For he realized by now the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy, which means jealousy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowds to demand to release Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, Then what should I do with this man you call king of the Jews? Then the crowd shouted back, Crucify him. Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, Crucify him! So to pacify the crowd, to ease the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them, and he ordered Jesus to be flogged with a lead-tipped whip and then turn him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Now, the crowd that is yelling these nasty things that have been stirred up by the Pharisees, they were the same crowd that Jesus rode in on the donkey for. I bet Jesus remembers seeing their faces as he rode in his triumphal entry and them singing, we love you, we praise you, thank you, God. And these are the same faces, the same people that are yelling at him and screaming, crucify him. And they did this because they had bad leadership. They chose bad leaders. And these leaders stirred up all of these evil things so that they could put Jesus to death. It seems almost everyone at this point, almost everyone has betrayed Jesus. And there doesn't seem like that there's anyone willing or able to fight for him. His best friends, his closest friend, and the people that were chanting his name are now chanting crucify him. Well, to save you the reading, because it's quite the long reading, Jesus is taken to a post where they whip him over and over and over again. They call this flogging. After Jesus is flogged and he has lost a lot of blood, they force him to carry his own cross. And this thing was heavy. And not only did they make him carry this really heavy cross, but they make him carry it all throughout Jerusalem. It's a big city. 
He's lost a lot of blood and he's carrying a really heavy wooden cross. It gets so bad that Jesus passes out and falls to the ground and they're beating him and they're spitting on him. They're cursing him. They have to find another guy to carry Jesus's cross while he limps all the way to Golgotha, which is the place where he will be crucified. For him to be crucified, they lay the cross down on the ground and they lay Jesus down on top of it. And then they take these big, jagged nails in this hammer and they nail him to the cross. They drive nails through his wrist and through his feet because that's how they got their victims. That's how they got people to be crucified to stay on the cross is by nailing them to it. Not only do they nail him to the cross, but they take off his clothes. They disrobe him. And then, just to poke fun at him, they put a sign on the top of it that says, King of the Jews. I cannot imagine the pain that Jesus went through. The pain that he went through physically. The pain that he went through emotionally. Or even the pain that he was going through spiritually. Because he was fighting the biggest spiritual battle of all. I cannot imagine what it was like to be him. And this is the crazy part. The craziest part about it all. Is that Jesus still loves these people. All these people that are cursing him. That are spitting him. That are beating him. All his friends that ran away. His best friend that denied him three times. He still loves them. And as he's dying on a cross and he's taking his last breath, he says one phrase, and that's, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Did you catch that? Father, forgive them? Jesus is asking God to forgive us even though we have been so cruel to him. Jesus loved us even though we turned our backs on him. Some people might say that they would have done something different, but even Jesus' best friend betrayed him. It walked away. How could we have done any different? What happens at the cross is that Jesus dies. And as he dies, he says his final words, It is finished. And just as that happens, the prophecies that said that the earth would shake and that the veil in front of the holy and holies will be torn did exactly that. At this moment, what Jesus had done was cover our sins with his blood. He saved everybody because Jesus died on the cross. He was able to, he was able to bring us a true friendship with God, a true friendship with himself. Even though it looks like Jesus has lost, Jesus has just won the greatest battle ever. Today, before we pray, I want you to know that Jesus died even for you. All those sins you have ever done or ever uh, committed or caused someone else to do can be forgiven because what Jesus did at the cross. You don't have to live with those regrets of the things you've done. You don't have to even live with those voices in your head that may say disgusting things like, uh, you're unimportant, you're ugly, how could anyone love you? You don't have to live in a world with those voices in your head because Jesus died for those things, because he came to tell you you're important, you are loved, you are desired, and more than anything, that he wants to be with you never forgetting you. Jesus came into this world to let you know that you are wanted and that there is a God who created you and was willing to die for you. And the good news about this story is that though it looks like the end and though that Jesus is dead at this point in our story, it's only the beginning. It's only the beginning. Let's pray. Your Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son. God, it's not fair. 
It's not fair that he had to die that death. That place was supposed to be mine. That place was supposed to be for all of us sinners. But Jesus took that instead. God, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for making him stronger than I could ever be. God, it's because of your son. It's because of Jesus that we are able to have a relationship. Jesus, it's only because of what you've done that I am able to know you. And I thank you for that. Thank you, God, for who you are. It's in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. So, this is the usual part where I give you an activity or a question. This is what I have for you. I have a challenge for you today. A challenge for you to be real honest. You see, what I want you to do is that I want you to get a piece of paper and a pencil, okay? And, and on the top of it, I want you to write the word sin. And, and below it, I want you to really take some time and be honest and think about this and write down sins that you have made or that maybe you caused somebody to make. The sins like that you have lied, that you have hurt somebody, that you did something even though that God did not want you to do that. I want you to write that out on a piece of paper. And then if you're taking this seriously, and I hope that you are, I want you to pray that God will forgive you over everything that's on that piece of paper. And if you really do take it seriously, Jesus will forgive you. Jesus will say, my child, I love you. I forgive you. All you had to do was ask. Then once you're done with that prayer, this is where it gets fun. I want you to destroy that piece of paper. I don't care how you do it. If you tear it up and you shred it, good. If you flush it down the toilet, that's fine. If you go bury it out in the yard, okay, that's fine. Just don't hit a pipe, all right? Just destroy this paper because that stuff does not matter anymore. God doesn't care. He's already wiped your slate clean. That stuff that that's on that paper will not hold you down anymore, especially if you start to live with Jesus, serving him. Destroy that paper. And here's the next thing that I challenge you to do. I challenge you to do this with your parents. Maybe they're not there when you're writing everything down, but they're helping you get rid of it. Imagine a family, you and your parents, getting rid of this sin out of your house. That you guys are coming together and leaning on each other to get rid of this piece of paper. You guys can come up with some creative things. Please let me know. If you message me on Facebook, if you send me a video, I don't care. But I want you to destroy that paper once you're done. That's my challenge to you. And once all of this is said and done, there is nothing to hold you back anymore and start living a life that honors Jesus. I'm praying for you all. I hope that you're really taking this to heart and I want to hear back from you and I hope that I can be with you soon. Uh, I think about you guys all the time and miss you so bad. And uh, join us for our next video, which will be next Monday, where we talk about our fourth part in the resurrection. It's a fantastic story. It's the greatest ending ever, but it really isn't the ending. It's only the beginning. Hope to see you guys next time. See ya.